Officially locks up. It's Mike Wall back again with another episode of the Agent Revolution podcast where we deconstruct some of the biggest challenges facing today's real estate agents so that they can build a sustainable, profitable, and most of all, fulfilling real estate business. I'm Jack today. Today, me and my man, Jacob Barnhill, are talking about how to grow your business, leveraging tools, systems, and people. This show is packed with gold nuggets. I'll also be posting the show over at explodingwealth.com when we're done. So head on over there for the replay. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Jacob, man. What's up? Hey, man. Excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to be on here with you guys. This is cool. Let's no, do it. Man, I'm stoked, man. And I'm really stoked about today's topic. I, I As I said in the, in the pre-show, man, I think we can add a lot of value to a lot of real estate agents' lives um, talking about leverage. No matter, what, um, no matter what area of your business you're talking about, you can add leverage and typically, um, and typically make a lot of, or a, a big impact uh, no matter where you're at. So I'm super excited to talk about that. Um, before we get started, man, let's, um, let's give everybody a little bit of a background on you, man. Go tell me a little bit about you know, yourself, how you got into real estate and, and um, yeah. what you're doing now. Yeah, mine's probably a little less conventional than uh, a lot of the, the agents that wanted to just maybe initially get their license, things like that. I was actually in the military at the time and uh, I got uh, I started reading up on a real estate book while I was deployed and got into wholesaling, signing contracts. All right. Yeah. And yeah somebody uh, I was in network marketing and I was horrible at it. It was my first taste of sales. <laughs> I never I never sold a thing. I was I sucked at I sucked at it. So somebody, you know, I was talking to business and trying to walk the walk and all that stuff. And somebody's like, I really think you'd be interested in this. And it was a wholesaling book. And I, re I read that book and I was just like, man, this is it. Started getting into Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. Um, came back home from that deployment and started getting into doing my first couple of wholesale deals. And I got wrapped up with uh, investment coaching and I did that for a while. Yeah. And, and then wanted to get my license purely just to have MLS access so that I could run my own comparable sales, start going after some MLS listings for my own flips and, and my own investment deals sure. and ended up doing really well with myself and pretty much made a plan to make make a jump from the military at 12 years, which is very non-typical, atypical of a military member that goes past their 10 year mark. Yeah. And we did really well for ourselves, my wife and I, uh, getting out of the military and we made a full jump. Uh, ended up making a last minute strategic plan to come back to the Columbia market. We were actually working Tacoma in uh, near Seattle in Washington State. Uh, we wanted to get back closer to family. We had some family members that were sick. So we came back to Columbia and I got my real estate license here. We sold 26 homes our first year, 29 right. our following year. And it was just uh, just hustle, man. Hustle, a little bit of Facebook, uh, you know, but mainly hustle. So how uh, long have you been doing it now? So we're actually in our, what are we? We're in our third year now. We're in That's our third great, year. Man. You guys yep. are you guys are, are hitting it on all cylinders, man. And, and uh, you know, what I love about your story is it's actually the complete opposite of mine um, where I got into just the residential piece up and yeah. now birthed out of that was an investment business where we're doing a lot of wholesaling now uh, with cool. my business partner, Jay Toms. But, um, and then I have a, I have a partner also on the residential side, um, John Powelski. And, and we, so it's great. We, you talk about the power of leverage and those are two great guys that are associated yeah. with me and my businesses. And so like back it up just a little bit, because I want to know I, I, everybody like real estate kind of, it's the funny thing about real estate. And I've had this conversation with people before is, is like nobody, usually nobody ever goes to school to become a realtor, right? Nobody ever yeah. grows up and says, Hey, you know, I want to be a real estate agent, right? That's not anything our parents ever glorify unless you know, they're in real estate themselves. Right. And so I want to, what I want to try to resonate with, with you is like, like you obviously you picked up that book. And, and if you don't mind, what was that book that actually changed, you know, kind of changed your mindset about what you wanted to do? It was some magical free up your time, make all the money in the world. What was it called? It was, uh, I have to get back to you on that one. It's yeah. been a while. I, I read that book one time or maybe a couple times over and that was it. I never really went back to that book. I just started consuming everything else I could get my hands but on. Honestly, it's not really that important. It, it, it wasn't the book that created the transformation uh, for right. me. It was the message. And so right. it was where, yeah, you heard the message at the right time and then 
you know, you it it, it kind of changed your trajectory, right? And and what you wanted out of life, you knew right. it opened your eyes to uh, a different way of living, and and you knew that that that's what you identified with, and that's what you aligned yourself and your vision with to go to go out and get right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think it was leveraged from the start. And I think that was the power. I feel very fortunate to have the 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 knowledge, uh, you know, thrown on me from the investments uh, side of things, because I think there's so much more leverage there to start with for people because yeah. people start thinking from a bit a true business owner aspect. I know there's a lot of people in network marketing or an agent and we call it our business, but they're out there hustling every day and they don't have those leverage pieces in play. I think from a, an investor standpoint, from my experience, I see a lot more people trying to incorporate leverage sooner and having that mindset sooner that there has to be a business. There has to be team members uh, at play, right? And not just us out there hustling. So I I was fortunate to see that first. Uh, So yeah. Are you still doing the investment side or are you guys just focused really on the residential side? Um, So um, right now we just closed the flip last Friday. Uh, We had a rehab property close um, and then we got another one. We're, we're buying, we're doing a 1031 exchange for that one. We're closing August one and we got another one on the, on the market right now, downtown Columbia. So moving so, and shaking, man. I love yeah. it. I love it. I love few, it. A few Airbnbs. Uh, we've done some assignment stuff. So I just tell everybody, they're like, what kind of real estate do you do? I'm just like, if it's a single family home, just come talk to me. <laughs> right. You'll figure yeah. out what to do with it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So talk about then, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word leverage, a lot of people just think about, you know, well, it's it's people, right? It's like hiring my first admin or you know, hiring an ISA or, you know, hiring a contract manager or a listing manager or, or whatever, you know what I mean? And that's not, that is part of leverage, but like, I want people that listen to this show, I don't want them to turn it off just because they think that they're not at that part of their business, because we also know that some of the first pieces of leverage that we introduce into our business are technology, right? Tools, systems, and resources. And and, and, and by and large, because they're they're not as it's not as much of an investment right as it is in as as to, to make in in technology as it is in people right and we know we can always you know fire technology fairly easily and you know we uh when we hire people we're we're not only responsible for, for ourselves but we're also responsible for them so what what do you yep. what, the the agent that's maybe you know they're not quite to the point where they're hiring their first admin at what kind of leverage and you can speak to this because you're, you know, you're a couple years in. What kind of leverage is some of the, the what was some of the first leverage that you introduced into your business? Oh, I always joke the, that I cheated because uh, my wife got her license uh, right out the gate. So she's been with me from the very beginning. There was some of the paperwork that we had. I, I think uh, at Cal- when I was at Keller, we were calling it green sheets. And I never filled out one green sheet. As soon as I, I looked at it, I was just like, I'm going to go get another sale. Can you fill this out? And we, you know, we just kept rolling. So I always say I kind of cheated. That was my first little bit of leverage. Yeah. My wife's been with me from the very beginning. It was uh, like pulling teeth with the investment side, but she already knew we were in real estate full time uh, coming back to Columbia and I have my agent license. So it was a commitment. She knew that that was, she was going to help, help our family make, make a move in that direction. So other than that, uh, the next piece of leverage uh, I would say is probably a coach. I've had a coach before my wife was really helping uh, us with a lot of stuff. It's just reaching up and trying to figure out a better a better way. That's really always been, which is a big part of the, the group that we're in, you know, is always trying to find that better way, trying, trying to find the most efficient, most effective way to do something. I never really liked wasting my time if I knew open houses weren't working. I try to find another way. There's something I'm missing. Uh, you know, uh, I like the grind, but I never wanted to just do it to do it. So I always like to go to the to the coach or figure out who was who in the market. I've been I've been in marketing presentations when I first got at wholesaling to the uh, two investors in my market falling flat on my face. Like, let let me give me some money to go do some marketing for you. And I'm going to go do this. And they're like, but there's no proven strategy. And I'm just like, but I'm, I'm ready to just go find that leverage, that handle and just hit it. Yeah. And like, let's, let's go find that big piece and keep moving, you know? So, yeah. The, so to me, when I think about leverage in its purest form, I think um, leverage to me is time. Right. It's it's anything yeah. because when we get into this business, um, most of us have one thing in abundance and that's time. And we don't mm-hmm. typically we don't have a lot of money. Right. And and what yeah. happens is 
you know, as you start doing more deals, you have like your time is is up here and your money's down here. And then, you know, that kind of flip flops. Right. And then right. what happens is so like you have a lot of money and then you have no time. So what 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 you do is you start buying your time back and typically you, whatever you're spending money on is leverage. Right. So like right. like for me, I'll give you an example. Like I, I my business when I got into the business, it was my, the foundation of what I did was, was hammering expired leads religiously every day. Right. So when I got into the business, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was literally going to the MLS and, and they posted the expire data there every day. Right. So they posted the expire data. I would click on the link for the expire data. I would look at the addresses and then I would cross reference the addresses to the tax records and then take the name of the individual from the expireds and run that through whitepages.com, right? And so right. I had a lot of time, right? I had a, I had the time to be able to go in and do that. And 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 I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, um, but if you don't have a lot of money, that's what you do. And so what I did, you know, is I started listing expireds, right? I started making a little money, make a little more money. And and then, you know, I, 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 did, I did a lot. I was a research guy like you, man. I was just addicted to podcasts and, and always growing and getting better. And then I, you know, I heard about a tool called Red X, right? And so Red X was this system yeah. that delivered the expired data right into your inbox every single yeah. day. And there was a dialer component to it as well. So uh, again, I, that was a $200 or $300 a month investment, but what it did was it gave me more time, right? right? So with more time, I could be more productive and so forth and so on. So that's, that's really the way. And so when you, when you talk about how to start out with leverage in your business, would you agree that that's maybe one of the, the simplest forms of leverage is technology? Oh yeah. I mean, you could get stuff. I've used Mojo Dialer and turn it on. When I, when I first started, I was doing six hours a day when I had all the time and no pipeline. It was six hours a day of texting and phone calling just straight from my phone, just trying to find somebody to talk to me and any way I could get them to talk to me about anything, whether it was real estate or not. And that was what I was doing. And then I figured out specific scripts, expired. So I could get that data imported and I got on a triple line dialer and was taught how to start tracking my numbers, you know, and, that that started to be a lot more productive for me. I got to the point where I knew getting on that, I could shave down just to a few hours a day, one, two hours a day on the phones and I could get an appointment every 12th, 15th contact. That was good. That was a little bit more security and stabilization in the, in the business, getting some leverage. Yeah, in there like that. absolutely. Yeah. And I, I would agree with that. And, and even so you can even get more granular than 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 just calling like, I mean, than having technology in place to deliver the expireds, right? Because expireds yeah. themselves are, they are, they're a list of buyers or excuse me, sellers that you've created that are more likely to um, want to list their property, right? You know, two things, right. you know, number one, they want to sell their property, you know, number two, that they're willing to hire an agent to do that, right? And right. so if I gave you a phone book, and said, here, call A to Z and find somebody that wants to sell their home, or I gave you a list of expireds for that morning or you know, for the last 12 months, you're mm -hmm. more likely to get an appointment out of calling that list of expireds than you are calling that phone book. So right. that's another form of leverage. And you know, so I, what I'm really trying to, to identify with people is people in their business right now who are, who are saying, you know, I'm, I'm not at that point now to where I need to leverage because I think I do believe that the misconception in our industry is that, you know, people are leverage and people are a form of yeah. leverage. But, you know, leverage, leverage, it, it starts with you and it will finish with you as well. Leverage will always be a part of your business or it should be if you want to be the most productive version of yourself. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I would even go a step further is is teaching, which is kind of one of the things I was going to get into about what I teach my people is in, when you start teaching other your people about leverage, getting them to understand that concept. So we're teaching the trainer to be the trainer and and having them wrap their heads around leverage. That way you're not the bottleneck on leverage. We can create leverage within leverage. And I think that that's that's even a bigger goal. Is, that's like creating leaders, right? Yeah. We're creating creating those leaders through those people. So when did you realize or at what point in your business did you realize that um, 
that you were you you are you were already utilizing leverage. I mean, some at some point you probably talked to some coach or read some book that said, right. "Hey, you know, if you introduce leverage into your business, you know, you can be more productive. You can be right. in two places at one time, right?" And so, at what point did that kind of that message just you know kind of slap you in the face? Yeah, I think that that was uh, just watching what the guys inside the investment community I was in, what they had built. uh, I really look at that as like the pinnacle with everything that I've always done. And I just look at like the time that they have and all the people that they have working around them. And I was just like, I think I got it very naturally from the beginning. I knew where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be the guy going to make a $20,000 check to go out and go make another $20,000 check to make, to be the guy to go make the next 20. Like I could only do that so many times. I'd rather be the guy and make 5,000 and be more strategic with my time, spend more time with my, my kids. I felt like I had that from the very beginning. Like I knew I knew that I needed leverage from the very beginning to build what they have. It required it required more than just me. And and I had that thought from the very beginning. So, yeah. So and I the, the way I think of leverage also is that, you know, I think leverage in its highest form, leverage creates opportunity for you to be in the area of your business that you're either most dollar productive or that you enjoy being the most. Right. And right. so what, what you when you're introducing leverage into your business, I always tell people, you know, make a list of the things that you either do not like doing or the things that are, are not very productive. In other words, they're the things that you're not where you're not in your 20 percent. Right. And, and start there. Right. So like what 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 somebody new into the business or even who's been into the business for a while that, you know, wants to um, introduce leverage into their business or just get a better grasp on what it is, is start make a make a list and make a list of the things you you hate to do or that you um, that you don't enjoy doing or or, or that, you you know, either you hate to do yeah. or you shouldn't be doing because they're not dollar productive. Right. And right. and start leveraging those things out. So if it's looking up expired data, right, it's maybe, OK, I've got some money to reinvest into my business and I'm going to look at, you know, Vulcan seven. Right. Would you right. you think I mean. To me, if, if leverage equals time and like in, in, in time equals productivity, hopefully for most of us and being in our 20 percent, what does that mean for you and your business? In other words, like you understand leverage in your business. So where is your time best spent at this point in your business? Um, for me right now, uh, I'm I'm on the verge of getting our ISA to handle all of our all of our calls. I mean, where I'm at really right now, and I talk to my team about a lot, like if we were a dentist office, right, does, does the dentist handle incoming calls? If there was a, a problem and the, and the client needed to reschedule because their tooth was aching or the work that the dentist just did and they needed to come back in and get it fixed, they wouldn't call the dentist's cell phone, right? That way, the dentist has the time to work on the clients that he has scheduled right now. And we have a system that's put in place for that for that client to be to be handled, you know, through through a phone or a, or an online system or whatever, you know. And on the admin thing, I was gonna say too. You made me think of it like I don't. I think with the admins now that you can just pay a transaction fee off the top, even if it's just part time. Everybody can afford one right now. I think if if you're out there without an admin right now, you need to go get one yesterday. Yeah. You need to go list out the things that you're not good at, and you need to start start right there. Yeah. And, and work a 200 300 400 dollar transaction on every single deal and get that going yesterday right that uh, definitely needs to happen and so i would agree wholeheartedly with that by the way and so most people most sales people most good sales people are not good at administrative duties and vice versa most really good at admins are not good at sales right. and so what jacob is saying is that if you're a good salesperson, you need to leverage your administrative duties off your plate right away. Yeah. And what that'll allow you to do is to be in your 20% or in front of more buyers and sellers, right? To create more opportunities. Right. <clears throat> so, you know, with with the whole, like, and by the way, you mentioned having an ISA, again, another form of leverage, right? An inside sales agent. What what are the responsibilities of your ISA or what responsibilities has your ISA removed from you? Yeah, uh, 
prospecting uh, with expired data. Uh, we've got, I've got her running cash scripts too with some of our We Buy House Craigslist ads. So she can kind of do both. We call it, we have one script called the swing script. So she can do, she can talk to people that may be a listing, may, may, may be cash or both. We're not sure. We need to field that out. She'll set appointments for me. Um, she'll field sign calls for me. She, um, she'll follow up with people that maybe I was trying to get a hold of and I had in my pipeline. I just can't get a hold of them. And I'll kick them over to her and you know, she'll she'll try to get that get that uh, lead warm again. So she just removes a lot of the stuff that just is uh it's 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 not if you were to break down your pipeline into your 20 and 80 percent, right? I get to focus more on my 20 to my one percent of my pipeline that I know are gonna convert at the highest, and she can go lob up the next best opportunity for me. Yeah. And so one one thing that I want people to keep in mind also is that leverage is not something you just add into your business and your world is instantly better. It's it's like anything else. You have to inspect what you expect, right? And yep. so when you put leverage into place, you also have to put systems and processes in order to manage that leverage, right? So right. what kind of systems and processes do you have in place for your ISA, for instance? Yeah, manage? I would say my number one, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have in, in checklists and things that I'll go back and there's recordings of calls and things like that. Um, my number one thing that I love is our one on ones every week, because that's the catch bucket for anything that we may be missing. That's accountability. Even if we're not sure where the, where the line is, we can redraw that line every week. Hey, this is what we talked about last week. This is how close were we to that mark this week. Right. And then we can adjust if that's not the mark we need to be hitting, you know, uh, if we don't feel that that's that's relevant. Right. Uh, so I love our one-on-ones. That's my number one tool. One-on-ones every week for everybody. I even do them with my, with my wife. She's our tran head transaction coordinator right now. So, and Jacob, how would you, um, if you were talking to one of the people in your business, what, for instance, if, if it were an agent or an acquisitions manager or an ISA working for you, what kinds of, uh, of things are you having those folks leverage? So uh, my one that came to mind is my uh, admin, our, our exec. She uh, she has a virtual assistant. I've had work with us in the past. He's very good. He's very very detailed. He's he's always on time. He does a really good job with anything we've ever asked him to do, and we've given him lots of different things that he can do virtually. And uh, one of the things she's been doing is building a list of things that are mundane for her. We look at her twenty percent. What she's supposed to be doing. And what are the things that are clogging up her day? What are the, the things that she's doing very repetitive that maybe aren't her highest and best use of her time? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're building a list right now to bring in a very low cost uh, assistant for the main assistant on the team. Yeah. yeah. And what's great is in growth, when your business is in growth mode, is that there are opportunities for leverage, um, not only for you, but also for your staff. So. Right. Like, how are you, like you personally, how are you personally determining what things you want to leverage off your plate? Um, yeah, if it's, I mean, if it's, it's a good question. There's a couple different ways I could go with it. If, if it's not, right now where I'm at, if it's not talking to clients and putting something under contract or, or negotiating and, and it's something that I know that I could turn into money in the next 30 to 45 days, then it needs to be removed from my plate. It's plain and simple. Yeah, that's all it is. So what is, and I know where this like instantly where people, I remember being at the point in my business where I needed to make my first hire and it was probably the most terrifying thing I've ever done with the exception of making my second hire and third hire, right? And, um, and I just remember, you know, I knew I could always be responsible for myself and yeah. I, unsure that uh, that to take on the responsibility as uh, of, of an employee and you know their family but you know it was the ultimately was the best decision I ever made because my business exploded and we've never looked back so what what is your to the person that maybe has leveraged technology and systems um, as far as they can and they're at the point to where they need to make probably their first hire or second hire um, what do you say to that person about, you know, getting maybe over that fear? Um, 
it's it's really gonna it's still gonna be a fearful thing i think for most people i will say i never had that fear i knew that that's i needed that person well, I knew that that funny, was, dude huh I have that i said yours was free man yeah yeah i know but even like the, the paid one i i knew that we needed one and we got a great one and we're really happy to have her yeah. uh but i would just say you just do it you just gotta do it if you're building a business or quit like you you, you want your time back that's that's the that's the you know the goal that's that's the the end thing here you got to think about what you're building you need you, you have to make that decision you've got to get uh you've got to get help good help even if you know even if it's not great i've heard people say hold out for great help but it just depends i think where you're at in your business if you're missing opportunities for you being able to continue to grow the business i would say at least get good help right at least get good help if you can get great help great go get great help for sure don't don't miss a chance to put great help on the bench yeah for sure ever but if at a minimum go get some good help and get somebody to to, to allow you to go find some other opportunity and I, I just to piggyback on that i would i would always look at um like leverage in an investment and not a cost, right? Yeah. Because when you make an investment in someone, you know, ultimately, if you invest in anything, you look for a return, right? And when you invest in people, you know, your your hope is that when you invest in them, that not only do they make you the money back that you invested, uh, but they, they multiply your business into making uh, maybe double or even triple what you're paying them in a salary or, you know, uh, in, in bonuses or, or however you've structured their payment. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think that it should cost you more <laughs> more to, to put some help. They should allow you. To, I've heard it said three times the income for your first admin. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I don't know if that's the perfect rule or there's maybe better ways to do it, but I think it's a pretty good rule. Uh, even if you're doubling your income, I think that's great. There's always ways to improve, but uh, you know, you get somebody to come in, give you some more free time. They should be allowing you to go get another two, three transactions uh, or, or double or triple your your business. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Every month. Yeah. So where are you specifically? Where are you at, Jacob, right now in your business using leverage? Like, how is your how is your team structured right now? Yeah. So we have uh, I have a, a company thousand calls a day. We have an outside sales rep right now. And he'll lob up some of the opportunities that our inside sales rep will call, requalify, see if they're a nurture, whatever. Uh, and then our ISA, she will reach out to other opportunities that we're other leads, direct mail, things like that, sign calls, Craigslist. So then we have Mary Pat. Mary Pat's our uh, operations slash exec right now. She's sort of lead uh, lead coordinator. She's the catch all. We call her team team mom, you know, she's our mom on our team. She's making sure everybody's where they're at and where they need to be and, and everything's happening. And then she's just another person that I kind of bump everything off of like where we're going, you know, and how it's all supposed to be uh, uh, going. So she's also in the database, you know, her main focus is, is our people making sure that they're talked to, they're on their plans and people are following up on those plans. Then there's me, I'm the only sales guy on the team right now. Uh, one of the, you know, I'm not perfect. We've gone through uh, one buyer's agent so far and it just didn't work out. So that's part of the business. So I'm the only sales guy. I'm doing both buyers and sellers. It's a struggle some days. Yeah. But uh, then I have my wife who's our, our tr main transaction coordinator. And we have two companies uh, that um, that we're trying out right now that do transaction coordination where we're just paying them off the top or admin a transaction coordination fee. Uh, and she's working new checklists that we've built recently with them and we're feeding them our deals now for our transaction coordination. So she's just kind of, my wife's an overlay. We're trying to get her removed and have those transaction coordinators uh, that were that are uh, remote right now, which I think in the future, we may have somebody in-house to come in and just manage, manage that or the outs or the external transaction coordinators may go away completely. I'm yeah. not sure how that's going to look for the future of the team. But for right now, that's a very cost effective way for us to be able to grow and get some leverage is just pay someone off the off the top, tra charge a little bit extra in, uh, yeah. in the transaction. So what is the goal with uh, creating that leverage piece for your wife of removing the transaction management? What do you want to free her up to do? Um, uh, spend more time with kids <laughs> would be a great one. Um, 
you know, we've been hustling in this business for about the last five years. I know that she'd probably love some downtime, but I don't know if she'd really take it. She likes to she likes to work. She likes to be, be fulfilled and have a mission too. she really loves staging. We, we would love to get ourselves built back up to uh, be able to handle a lot more on the investment side of the business. I think it's a very effective way to run your business, a lot less logistics and a lot higher yield um, in a real estate company. Um, but uh, she she wants to do staging interior design. That's her end goal. Yeah. Well, I don't want to gloss over that, man, because um, this actually illustrates the second part of my point of putting leverage in place, not necessarily to make more money, but to um, have, you know, design your life, have a better yep. use of your time. And, you know, money doesn't always equal happiness, right? Sometimes designing a life and paying a little bit more money to design or live the life that you want is a form of leverage. And obviously you guys understand that, right? That at the highest level, you're willing to pay a little bit of money to free her up to spend some more time with the kids because you have that's something that you value, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm not taking away from that at all, but in this case, we're actually, you know, that's a transaction fee is paid for by the client, so that's even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, that value. I think it's great, and it was a great segue into the second part of that. And you know, I, I he, one thing I want people to understand is that you know, it's not always about the money, right? Uh, you know, I we you could do everything. There's a point in your business to where it is probably probably the most profitable when you know you're doing most of the work and maybe you have an admin or two and maybe a buyer specialist low yeah. overhead you're yeah. you're making a ton of money but you literally have no time to do anything and you're it, it, listen i can remember being at that part of my business and it was miserable man like i don't i was making a lot of money and i was just i was absolutely miserable i didn't mm -hmm. have any time to spend any of it or do anything with it right and you know it was putting a strain on my personal life it was putting a strain on my relationship with my kids and I realized it right away that I'm willing to pay money yeah. to bring other people in to yeah. be able to offset some of those things that, you know, that I want to do uh, because I'm not looking to live a life of, you know, just having, a, you know, uh, a ton of money in no time. I want to have a balance. I want to have, you know, I want to have money, definitely want to have money, but I want to have time as well with my family and with my friends and the people I enjoy in my life. Yeah, for sure. I know we've done, gone through our bouts where we've probably been on the heavier side of the work uh, uh, side of things than than we needed to be. You know, we're trying to get ourselves to a point where, you know, we don't have to worry so much, you know, where we're having to keep the pipeline full and it's just me and all that stuff, you know, and have something be a lot more consistent. And that's that's really, like you said, it's the, it's the end goal is just having a lifestyle. It's not about you know, my shift going from where I was recently to being in the in the group of people that we're in now is really talking more about net. Uh, who I forget who was saying it recently, but you know, we come from a world that talks about like your unit count and your and your gross commission income and things like that. But really, it's you know, I, I'm I love I love how someone put it recently, and they were just like, "What's your what's your net? The net's the real truth, right? What's your net time? Really, if you want to even go another layer in, what's your you know? Do you have the lifestyle you want?" And do you have the time to do it? That's really what it's about. Yeah. And, and like, I mean, that's so that's such a great point, man, because it's like, the, and I, I can't remember, um, gosh, somebody had posted, I think it was Kinder posted. Oh, here, I found it, man. Um, success is doing what you want, when yeah, you yeah. want, where you want, with whom you want, as much as you want. That's an actual, that's a Tony Robbins quote. Yeah. That doesn't say anything about having millions and millions of dollars, right? right. That illustrates it so well, man. And uh, I just, I read that the other day and I it just, I so resonated with that. So um, last thing I want to talk about, man, is, is you know, I, I think accountability is kind of a, it's, it's a buzzword in our industry. And, you know, to some people it has a, a positive connotation and some people it has a negative connotation in most 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 cases it's the team leader it has a positive connotation and team members a negative connotation yeah yeah but look, accountability i think is an important um aspect of having having leverage and we we kind of talked touched on this a little bit earlier but like how, what what is can can leverage exist without accountability 
I would say no. I mean, what's the point of leverage if we're not accountable? I think accountability is like what you said earlier. You got to inspect what you expect always yeah. and forever. Uh, I don't think that the leverage is ever going to work if we, if the people, the system or the tools never, never held accountable to the standard that we have to get the result. Yeah. And so like for those, for those people that, you know, were maybe who are building, right. They're in growth mode. What, what are, what is an example of um, for you? Like where, where you're using accountability where, where maybe like, I'll give you an example for me. Like I, like we did the ISA thing. I thought, I think for us, and we still on the investment side, we have uh, an, an outside salesperson with thousand calls, by the way. Um, but what we did early on is like, I just, in, in, these were some of the decisions I made in my business is we, we hired a really big ISA team and we had some accountability metrics in place. So we gave this impression of accountability, but we didn't manage it appropriately. And mm. we, you know, and, and so like when I looked at it, I remember the day that, that, you know, we were, um, we were looking at the money we were spending um, in ISA salaries and bonuses um, and the way we had the lead flow structured. So one of the biggest mistakes we were making, Jacob, is, is the fact that we were spending about $16,000 a month on Zillow, right? And we were funneling the Zillow leads into the ISA. So right. $16,000, right, on Zillow, right? So that was one cost that we were eating. Another yeah. cost that we were eating was the salary, right, for, for the ISA to be there to intercept the Zillow lead. And number two, they, those leads were converting at a higher level and it was taking them away from the leads, the internet leads that we had from, um, from Commission Z, who maybe were there further down and take a little bit longer to nurture and weren't having them call or having them um, spend very little time on like expired and for sale by owners, right? And so like I, when we reverse engineered that, man, it was like by the time they converted a Zillow lead, like we were almost at a net negative. We were making no money, you know what I mean? And and so they would just wait around until the Zillow lead came in because they knew it had a higher chance for conversion and nothing yeah. was converting. They were they were neglecting the internet leads. They were neglecting the for sale by owners and expireds. Yeah. And we got, and, and so the only, the only reason I tell you that is to illustrate that you have to have a layer of accountability in anytime you add any piece of leverage, you hold it accountable. And I don't care if it's a piece of technology. And the way to do that with technology is if you hire a Vulcan 7, for instance, and you're not, if you're calling Vulcan 7, but none of your lead uh, or none of your listings or none of your closings are coming from Vulcan 7, you know, it may be time to um, either evaluate you and what you're saying to the clients or, um, or, or the technology you're using, right? Like if you're getting right. bad data, yeah. What I'm saying is you've got to have those different layers of accountability in to always um, to always make sure that your investment is 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 giving you the return that it should. Correct. Yeah, yeah correct. And expectations up front, too, I think. And that's where coaching for me has always really been key. I've always learned so much from people, you know, doing it better or have done it well prior to me is what's the expectation of that ISA or that lead? What's that cost of conversion or what should we, what should we tell our ISAs that we're going to hold them accountable to? We actually had a really big shift with the coach recently because we were all about appointments and we made a shift to nurtures. How yeah. many relationships are you building every day? Cause we know that we have to build a pipeline. It's just a part of the, that's the nature of the beast. It's not that this ISA comes in and they have business immediately because we have great leads or crappy leads. It's, they have to build a pipeline. So in that respect, they have, they got to be focused on a nurture, not appointment. Otherwise they come in every day trying to set an appointment and they burn themselves out and they're focused on the wrong thing. The, the thing for the ISA to focus on is that nurture, that relationship yeah. that we're trying to, to get involved with. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Um, one of the things I'm curious about with you, because it sounds like um, you're a Keller guy and I was a Keller guy when we moved over. Um, for, well, first of all, how long have you been over to EXP? Uh, I've been with EXP about a month. And about a month, month okay. That yeah, is man. awesome, man. Yeah. And so, like, how long were you at Keller before that? I was at Keller for the remainder of time before that. What, two and a half? Two and a half? Yeah, two and a half years. Dude, that's great. And so, like, what happened? Like, I'm, I'm always curious. I love hearing everyone's story. You know what I mean? Like, when, when did you hear about EXP and when did you decide to make the move and why? 
Yeah, it was really a, I was looking for a coach. I was looking for a coach and I, and I ran into to Jay and all his guys. And I was just like, I really related to those guys. Uh, they have a big lake community where they were at in Lawton, Oklahoma. We have one here. We're actually on the lake here in Columbia, South Carolina. I related to them. I, I started consuming all their content and I was like, this is what I'm looking for. I was looking for somebody who was going to teach me more of how to build a business. Then the EXP thing came with it and they showed me the opportunity with EXP. And I was like, this is perfect. I mean, to be able to combine a coaching program, exactly what I want to actually show me to build a business and not just make more phone calls or, you know, go out there and knock more doors or anything like that. Like this is the, the bigger leverage pieces that the big, big 900 pound gorillas in their markets are doing. And there's the the leverage piece with EXP and all the other the, the, the alignment with it and everything. I was like, this is beyond what I was expecting when I was reaching out to. Uh, one of my goals last year was actually to find a mastermind and to find a new coach wow. last year for business planning. And I found that and and more uh, reaching out to, to Jay and Mike. So it was cool. That's awesome, man. And th yeah, th those those guys, man, um, Jay, uh, Jay was, you know, kind of my mentor from afar. And I, when I started coaching, I started coaching with NAEA and uh, Kitchens was my first coach, actually. And um, just really resonated with what those guys were doing. I think that um, it's kind of a for me, it's a it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes when, you know, you're talking to agents in your marketplace and, you know, they have the blinders on. They're not they're not looking to see what's happening um, outside of their community or outside of the, the state that they're practicing real estate in. Yeah. And so like for me, that was one of the big things is is like I wanted to see what, you know, the top agents across the United States were doing. And I wanted to align myself with them in whatever way I could. And it sounds like that's the exact same thing you did, man. Yeah, I think I stumbled into all of that and more. I don't I really wasn't. I knew that there were bigger and better ways to do it. Uh, I knew that Columbia is very broke up market. And there's a ton of opportunity here. Uh, more than I really realized when I first started here. I mean, there's a ton of opportunity to become that big, big gorilla here. And I was just I was just looking for a better coach, a better way. I mean, just like Jay and all those guys talk about. And then when I, I saw him, I got all of that stuff that you're talking about. Like I, I didn't maybe I had the blinders on a little bit. I knew that there was a better way and I knew people were doing it. I just wasn't thinking about reaching outside my market. I wasn't thinking that I was going to find a really cool group of people who are all doing it and crushing it you know, in the same respect. I was just looking for a coach, but hey, that's what happens when you just get open, you know what I mean? You're just open, you're just ready to receive, and then, and it hit, it hit hard. I couldn't even, I always joke, like I couldn't finish, I was at the gym doing a leg workout, and I almost couldn't finish my leg workout when I hit one of their podcasts. I was just like, this is too big. I got to call, I got to call Jay today, that, that button that was there to get on his calendar and schedule that call. I was like, I'm calling it. Calling them today. <laughs> that, that's freaking awesome, man. I love that story. Um, so if 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 somebody's listening to this and they want to connect with you to learn more about your business or, you know, more about the wholesaling side or investment side or what you're doing with your ISAs or maybe they want to learn more about EXP, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, easiest way is go look me up on Facebook. Go send me a message um, or if you prefer email, you can hit me up at jacob at barnhillteam.com. Well, thank you so much, dude. As always, I just love sharing these stories week after week because I know EXP is literally changing agents' financial lives, my own included. Do me a big favor. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, please go to wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to this podcast. And if you want to learn more about why EXP is the fastest growing real estate company in the country or you're just interested in growing your business, head on over to explodingwealth.com. And if you want to jump on a call one-on-one -on -one with me, to learn more about my business, go to meetmikewall.com. And that is it for this one, folks. Boom, man.